Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913. More than 25 years ago, the interview series called Reflections in Time was developed by the late Professor Paul Borgi. It was intended to preserve some of the history of the University of Nebraska at Omaha by recording experiences of people who contributed to its development. With the aid of the UNO Alumni Association, I've continued Paul's work with this series. My name is Jack Newton. I'm retired now, but I'm still active as a professor emeritus. I've been on the faculty of UN Omaha since 1960 and served for 20 years as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I worked closely with Professor Borgi in developing his original interview series and continue it as a tribute to him. The year is 2007. It's uh, a day in late February, a pleasant day, and uh, we have here as a guest in the studio uh, Dr. Vern Hazelwood, who's uh, retired now but has been on the faculty of UN Omaha for a good many years. Welcome, Vern. It's good to have you with us here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start in by talking a little bit about you. I've uh, known you for a long time. We've served on committees together and right. done a good many things together. But uh, I need to know a little bit about your background. Tell us something about uh, where you grew up and where you went to school. Okay. Actually, I uh, am a Missourian uh, from the Show Me State. Uh, went to, uh, uh, in fact, I went to a uh, one-room schoolhouse in northwest Missouri that was called Common Sense elementary school. What, uh, what town was that? That was near Barnard, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And it was a school in which my uh, mother and my grandmother and aunts and uncles all attended. And uh, then uh, I was, uh, uh, since it was out in the country, uh, went to uh, uh, a high school at Graham, Missouri, halfway between Barnard and, and uh, Graham. Finished high school there, and even though I had a, um, a scholarship to go to Northwest Missouri State University at Maryville, Missouri, it was too close to home, so I decided I would see what was in Omaha. And uh, came to Omaha and uh, went to a business, a private business school that uh, offered uh, courses in bookkeeping and shorthand and contometers in those days. and and. Uh, when I finished that, I began working for uh, uh, Union Pacific Railroad. One of the uh, it was uh, considered a kind of a uh, prestige uh, place to work in the sense that they paid very well. And so I worked for Union Pacific until Uncle Sam called, and and uh, that was the Korean War mm -hmm. conflict, and uh, I was drafted into the um, into the army. Um, had a bit delay there. Uh, my father, I was already going to the Army, and Union Pacific had given me a leave, and my father had an emergency appendectomy, and so the local um, board there, selection board, said, well, we, we, you probably need a couple of months to help your dad out on the farm. So it was great basic training that I received, and, and rather than going in, in in, I guess, June, I w actually went in in August. But anyway, after I uh, served a couple of years in the Army, which uh, is always uh, educational and uh, nice. Did you get over to Korea? Uh, I never left the States. Oh, okay. uh, interesting and I did my uh, basic training at Fort Leonard Wood and So and you were right uh, near home then in and Missouri. I, I, you just uh, didn't go very far. Right. 
but I was in the criminal investigation detachment uh, of the military police while I was at uh, Fort Leonard Wood and spent um, my entire time there. And, uh, but um, uh, you said you came to Omaha to I presume that was to see what the big city was like, but Kansas City was closer, wasn't it? Why did you Kansas come City to was closer, and frankly, it was because of this business college, commercial extension. Oh. They had a good uh, uh, sales pitch and reps that went up to a lot of the high schools in those days. And uh, but a friend, a very close friend of mine in high school, he had um, two brothers that lived in Omaha. And he had been to Omaha a number of times visiting his brothers, and so uh, he encouraged me to to go with him. Well, and now, how did you up end up uh, going to the university here? Back then, it wasn't UNO; it was right. Omaha University, <coughs> Municipal University of Omaha. Right. Well, and even when I came in 1950, uh, was uh, working for Union Pacific. I took one course in English here at Omaha University, and you know it was way way out west but I remember taking that one way out in the 60s yes <laughs> you're correct <laughs> and rode a bus didn't have a car or anything like that um, but after the army and I went back to work at the Union Pacific and then uh, the GI Bill GI Bill was available so I decided I really this is a great opportunity and so that's when I began on my bachelor's degree here at then Omaha University. Now what uh, what was your major back then? I knew I wanted to major in uh, English. Mm -hmm. uh, you know the influence of teachers but my high school teacher uh, was just an inspiration to me and so Mrs. Largen always encouraged me and so when I came to Omaha University and uh, uh, I decided on English, and and then uh, my advisor was uh, Dr. Paul Kennedy, and he said, "You really need something to go with English, something besides that." And now, uh, Dr. Kennedy was in the College of Education back then. He was, and since I w and I wanted to be a teacher, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be a teacher of English, and uh, but he said, "You need something in addition to um, to English," and and this was in the late spring. And he said, uh, and I was in for my uh, advising sure. session. And he's wanted to take a library science course this summer. And um, uh, I said, what is that? And um, but uh, I took a course, uh, a five-week course from uh, the director of the library, and she was also the director of the instructional program of library science, uh -huh. Ellen Lord. And I remember uh, uh, Miss Lord very well. Yes, yes. Most people do who ever met her, right? right. But she was a. Um, I really, I just thoroughly enjoyed that summer uh, with her, and from there went on to uh, have, a, as they called it in those days, a minor in library science. And so you ended up graduating in uh, yes. what, about nineteen. In about uh, 1960, uh -huh. yes, and then I went from there into um, the uh, public schools, Omaha Public, mm -hmm. and then later on into uh, Lewis Central, which is south of Council Bluffs. And um, my wife and I, she had just gotten her degree, and we both uh, uh, then went over to Lewis Central and, uh, and taught there for several years. So I presume your degree was a Bachelor of Science in Education. It was, was it? Yeah, correct. So you went on and mm -hmm. taught. And, uh, right. Uh, and my right. first job opportunity was in library. It could have been in, uh, and I had a minor in speech, and mm -hmm. it could have been in speech or in English, but the first uh, job I had was in, uh, in a library, so I thoroughly enjoyed that. And then you um, eventually came and, and worked here at, uh, at the University of Omaha. Yes, I did, and I knew that a master's degree was the m minimum requirement. Mm -hmm. So during the summers, then my wife and I would go to the University of Denver, where I worked on my master's degree in library science. And then during the school year, I would teach in the public schools. But after I received my master's degree, then uh, I interviewed with Helen Lord, and she said, we need a government publications librarian. And I uh, didn't know what that was about, but fortunately, uh, she offered me a job before my last summer at uh, DU, and I took a course in government pub publications. And then did I began here. Did we have a here. fairly extensive collection of government documents? We did. And um, I kind of think it was a, maybe even today, I'm not sure, uh, kind of a well-kept secret. but. Um, 
University of, uh, of Omaha, now uh, UNO, is a depository library for the federal government. And there's just worlds of, of information, of course. And uh, I worked very closely uh, with faculty in terms of what type of uh, publications that they would like to have in our uh, depository collection. And there was a, uh, there's also a collection at Omaha Public Library as well as Creighton. But uh, we had a very, we had an extensive uh, collection yeah, of I've government used publications. It in courses I was teaching yes. over the years. Yes. And it's, uh, it really was very helpful. Uh, and I, uh, you know, uh, faculty members, well, students doing research, but faculty who were doing research, but also, um, I think I remember working with uh, Dr. Harl Dahlstrom mm -hmm. in, in the, the history uh, department. History department, uh, and uh, his research was taking him into a number of resources in which we just had a, a gold mine of information, and uh, so it's. Uh, uh, as it was then and later exciting to bring people and information together and uh, and government publications are not the easiest um, to find in terms of accessibility right. to how they're arranged and that kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. that uh, that's an interesting um, an interesting place to work in oh, it the is. library too. I, it is, right. Yeah, my son worked there one summer as oh, yes. a, when he was a student and right. he enjoyed it very sure. much. Sure, sure. Um, Okay, well, um, you uh, oh, let's let's go back, step back for a second. You mentioned uh, uh, Ellen Lord, Miss Lord. Okay, and uh, let's talk about her because she was never <coughs> interviewed in this series, mm. and uh, I think it would be interesting to uh, have some more information about it. Now, I remember her sitting behind a desk with a cigarette in her mouth, <laughs> and uh, she was an interesting person. Those were the days. Uh, of course, you could smoke in yeah. your offices and in the buildings, and. Um, and I must insert this, that Dr. Milo Bale is the one that hired me, of course, mm -hmm. and um, she had sent me over to interview. Uh, oh, every, to speak with Dr. Him. Bale interviewed everyone that was yes, hired. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but that was a, a rich uh, experience. But Ellen Lord was a, a real leader in, in, in library services, not just here in the community, but uh, regionally and nationally. Mm -hmm. But she was uh, uh, an inspiration and uh, had uh, in those days, of course, the uh, dress code was quite different today. But just an example is that uh, the, you, the women could not wear shorts or dresses, and uh, so if they wore long coats, she would actually uh, have them to unbutton their coat to see if they were properly dressed, <laughs> because they were to have, uh, you know, long. Well, they could wear slacks, but there were no shorts allowed, and uh, and she was very. Um, um, uh, you know, prescriptive, you might say, in terms of the proper behavior and dress in the library. I remember they could wear slacks, maybe, but they couldn't wear jeans. That Correct. Was, we, I, that was it. They uh, couldn't. The jeans. They weren't like today. You could uh, the slacks, but not, but not uh, jeans. She. Um, um, the government publications, many of them were located on the second floor of what now is the administration right. building. And one of my jobs was to not only serve in that capacity, but also to make sure things were quiet. Shh. And so uh, my job on the second floor of the library was going around and making sure that people were um, behaving themselves properly. I didn't much care for that assignment. I had done that in high school libraries, <laughs> and I thought, I'm not sure this is what I came here for. <laughs> it, uh, but Ellen was just a, a great. Um, individual and did so much for the University um, of Omaha, that what is what it was called in those days. Right. <coughs> and she was succeeded by uh, Dr. And then that's an interesting story because Ellen Lord, when she retired, she was replaced by John Christ, and his name is pronounced Chris, but we laughingly said that the Lord was succeeded by Christ, and, uh, and of course it was J. <laughs> Christ, <laughs> pronounced Chris. So that's always an interesting story of how uh, the Lord was succeeded by Christ. <laughs> yeah, I remember when he was hired, there was yes. uh, everybody told that joke. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people have never heard that today since right. all those years have yeah. passed. <laughs> um, then 
from the library you went to the uh, faculty of the College of Education. I did and it was, um, uh, as I said earlier, Ellen Lord was responsible for the library but also for the administration of the instructional program. Um, Dean Gorman and uh, and others. He was uh, dean of the College of dean Education. Dean of the College of the Education, time. Frank Gorman. Um, they had all been planning for. Uh, well, it was a big job. She had two jobs, and so they said to me, with my school experience and many of our students going into the elementary and secondary schools, would I be interested then in going into the College of Education mm -hmm. and heading up the Department of Library Science, the instructional aspect. And um, um, I uh, thought this was a great opportunity for me and uh, enjoyed working with students in that basis mm -hmm. and, and I felt had the proper background. So um, in 19, let's see, 66 I believe it was, then I uh, no longer was a government publications librarian and, and instead mm -hmm. transferred over to the College of Education where of course I was stayed for <laughs> until I retired. There's a, quite a bit of reorganization that eventually took place in the College of Education. Then there was the business um, department, there was library science, uh, home economics, uh, you have a major, but then eventually, well there was elementary and secondary, but eventually those departments all merged in, into uh, the Department of Teacher Education. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about what the university was like back then. Now, you didn't have uh, what's now Kaiser Hall uh, at the uh, back then. It was all in one building, wasn't it? A lot of it. A lot of the uh, action took place, you know, in what is now the Arts and Sciences uh, building. Um, and of course that's where the library was uh, at one right. time. I never worked in that library because I guess when I when I came. Um, they were building the the Epley building, which is uh, the, now the uh, the administration building. But there was that building, and then the uh, student center was built. And of course, the field house. Of course, you know, it, 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 this university, this institution, it was, it was on a hill, and as we said earlier, way out in the country. Mm -hmm. But I remember the cupola being. Uh, uh, lit up at night, I mean, and yes. just uh, uh, it was just a, a beautiful sight. And uh, Christmas time with big wreaths on. Yes, yes, <laughs> and of course, kind of tucked in behind it was, uh, you know, the shack. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 some qua a couple of quonsets, I believe, back there. Uh, but and the, uh, yes, and the White House sometimes they call. Ye it. Yes, true. <laughs> it was a, a, a frame building with mm -hmm. uh, white clapboard siding. Right, and that, uh, right. Uh, and it served as kind of uh, what would now be the student center. And that was the student center, right? right. It, it's just amazing. And the university, uh, well, of course, uh, became a part of the University of Nebraska system um, because uh, the mill levies failed. And, and But from that point on, the university really grew and uh, began to build. And, of course, our basis of support you know, was uh, much broader, mm -hmm. uh, not just the municipal uh, University of Omaha, but now part of the University of Nebraska system. So we just had uh, a number of buildings, um, including this one that we're in now, uh, that were built. And uh, I got to uh, know uh, what's now Arts and Sciences Hall very well since I spent most of my yes. career here there. Yes. But uh, and I remember you mentioned the library was there. I remember there was one. Uh, uh, room where the library, where at least circulation used to be, that had a kind of a dumbwaiter that went down into the stacks. <laughs> and uh, I the presume there were closed stacks back then. They were closed stacks, and, yeah. and they were, uh, so you'd give your request to um, a person at the desk, and you'd write down the call number and so forth, and then they would go retrieve it for you. And, uh, and, and that was a great uh, uh, change. Uh, when we then, when uh, the Epley building was built, the Epley Library, because that way it was open stacks, with the exception of government publications, yeah. and they're still and they're open access today. But um, you know that provided an opportunity uh, for the users of the library to browse. Oh, and it's and, uh, uh, yeah, it's very nice to be able to oh, do that. Indeed, because you discover a lot of things. I remember <laughs> when I was. Uh, 
first a graduate student at Ohio State, they had closed stacks, and that right. was a huge library. Sure. But then I found out that as a graduate student, I was allowed into the stacks, and I could it was assen essentially open stacks for graduate students. Sure. And it made all the difference in oh. the world once I found that out. Sure. Because, yeah. But they didn't advertise it much. <laughs> but you had those privileges. <laughs> but I did uh, have those privileges. Right, right. right. Uh, One of the things that it really, uh, you know, I remember so distinctly when we became a part of the University of Nebraska system and expanded, and we had a lot of, and the only way we could go was basically west, right. and there were a lot of beautiful homes, and of course, there's some of those are still uh, standing today. Won't be for uh, much longer, but they are yeah, still, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> but including the alumni house, of course, it's been added on to a yes. number of times. but. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we had to work very hard, uh, the administration, and frankly, I think everybody did, in terms of uh, uh, maintaining or developing a uh, rapport with the community, because they saw the university as you're moving west and you're taking down what are some beautiful homes and and well-known families uh, here, mm -hmm. and so that was a real challenge. Uh, and uh, some people parted with those homes very gracefully and were <coughs> good to deal with and then there were some that weren't quite so uh, <laughs> easy to, uh, to work with. They were more reluctant. Right. Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> but I know some of them said, well, we're kind of glad to get rid of this white elephant. It's been so expensive to eat. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Mixed blessings there, right. I guess. <laughs> Depending about which side you yeah. were on. <laughs> um, well, then you started in the education faculty. What was your rank when you started? Instructor or assistant professor? I believe I was an instructor because uh, one of the things that I discovered from Frank Gorman was now that you're in the College of Education and you will want to have uh, work towards tenure is that you need to have a doctorate. And that was a surprise to me. Um, I had uh, gone, as I said before, to a one-room schoolhouse mm -hmm. and never dreamed of, oh, I always thought I'd have a bachelor's degree and then, then a master's and then I, uh, a PhD wasn't in my mind at all. I said, all right, well, I'll start working towards that. He said, you, that is a requirement. And um, of course, by that time, a family was coming along, and, uh, but I taught and uh, worked on my PhD at UNL uh, evenings and summers, and eventually um, uh, earned uh, the PhD. And was I, that a, uh, you had a full-time job. Was that, a, was, <laughs> was that uh, pretty difficult for you to be working on an advanced degree and holding down a full-time job at the same time? It was, um, I kind of look back on those uh, days, Jack, and think, wonder how I did that. <laughs> uh, and you've heard this before from a number of folks who have uh, worked on advanced degrees that degree doesn't just belong to you, it belongs to your family right. because they were, in a sense, sacrificing for dad to work during the day and going to school at night and, and so it was, uh, it was a real challenge. But uh, you did uh, end up with a degree and that was when, in the early 70s something? Uh, in 1972, 72. right, yeah. received a PhD and uh -huh. uh, that was a Real uh, what was in what area was that in? That the was uh, and uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln did not have a strong program or certainly a, a, a doctoral opportunities in library science, and um, I uh, chose uh, to get the degree in educational administration uh -huh. because in libraries uh, the director is responsible for many administrative duties. Uh, now you ended up with a PhD. I did. And right. so you wrote a doctoral dissertation. I did. Dr. Meyer Henry, who was just well known know nationally, him well, yes. yes, he was my advisor, and we're all affected by the people that we've met uh, over the sure. years. But Dr. Meyer Henry um, was such a um, a leader and an encourager to me, yes. and I've often thought if he hadn't been the chair of my committee, would I have actually uh, would I have fin finished the degree? So I great. have uh, I owe him a big big thanks. And, uh, uh, now, how how uh, I remember from what I remember of those programs in the um, and I served on doctoral committees a number mm -hmm. of times back then with Dr. Meyer Henry. So uh, well, he was the he was the chair of the committee. Right. But um, 
uh, you had an opportunity to either select the Doctor of Education or the PhD. How come you selected the PhD? That was a bit more work since you had to write a dissertation. It was more work and um, I wasn't entirely clear the difference at the mm -hmm. time I was working on it and but one day Dr. Meyer Henry said we need to get things really down now what courses you're going mm -hmm. to pursue and we need to make the decision as to whether you pursue the, pursue the EDD or the PhD. He said it's likely that you're going to stay in higher education for the rest of your life and your mm -hmm. career and I would encourage you to work on the PhD and thus I did that and uh, and thus I you know yes, uh, good advice their foreign language <laughs> courses and uh, which they allowed me then to substitute many of the computer science courses good. and instead of taking a, a foreign language which really worked out very very well for me and as you say in addition to that there was the dissertation but um, uh, it was more work and I think it extended my um, um, coursework by a couple of uh, additional courses, but uh, I've always been uh, pleased that that was the decision that I had made. I think it was a good one. Um, well, let's, uh, you started talking a little, a short while ago about uh, different changes that you, you talked about changes in the curriculum as, as we progress from being Omaha University mm -hmm. to uh, UNO. Right. Uh, could you tell us, a, expand on that just a little more, tell us uh, uh, what, the, what it was like back uh, in the early days and, and how things changed? There were um, um, greater opportunities. Um, of course, we were growing even as a municipal university. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, and of course, the city was moving west and uh, the enrollment was, uh, uh, was up. Um, and so we were hiring more and more part-time faculty, uh, expanding our curricular offerings, uh, and especially in library science. Mm -hmm. uh, this was true um, uh, in two ways. One is that there were no courses offered in library science in southwest Iowa, so many of those students would come here. Now that to say that their requirements in Iowa were greater uh, than in Nebraska and so we developed courses to meet their needs but also at UNL they were offering some unique courses and so through a cooperative arrangement with UNL faculty and particularly Dr. Larry Kunkel um, worked uh, very closely he and I mm -hmm. on development of um, courses and then many of his students knowing that we had some courses here that they didn't have and, and vice versa. Then that was a, uh, a really a, a great uh, collaborative experience. So I presume you're preparing students primarily for work in schools as school librarians and That's sort of true. thing. That's true. But did some of them then go though to other uh, library some, positions? Some of them went into public libraries, mm -hmm. especially small public libraries. And a few went into special libraries such as law libraries mm -hmm. and medical libraries and that kind of thing. But the basic target in those days was elementary and secondary and as the years progressed and the demand was there, uh, we developed the, the curriculum so that we can uh, serve those people who couldn't go elsewhere uh, to work on what we say is American Library Association accredited degree. We worked on those opportunities here. But there are no, um, in this region, probably still, if I know, remember that correctly, there's no advanced work, master's degree level in library. There is not that ALA degree, right. correct. And uh, right now there is a great cooperative program that Dr. Pasco has developed with the University of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so students uh, can take courses both at, um, well, uh, via... Um, but you went to Denver, for example. But I for went your, right. for Denver for my degree. Right. right. At that time, they were uh, had a great reputation in library yes, science. Yes, well, I uh, didn't uh, see. I think Ray Means went there too. Another, another uh, yes. assistant director of the library, probably when you were there. He was, and you know, Ray was an instructor of mine, and then later on became a, a very close colleague, and and then eventually he went on over to direct the right. um, at Creighton. 
Uh, he lived just a few doors down from me, so and, oh, yes. uh, his daughter and my son went to high school, high school together, together and uh, right. grade school too, for that matter. Sure, so, uh, sure. Uh, I I knew Ray very well, and right. so tragic right. he died so young. But then he moved on to become director of the library at Creighton. At Creighton, and, uh, right. To this day, they've got a, I think a, a portrait of him in there. They do have. He was very well thought of. There. Right, right. And Ray was just a, another one of those persons that uh, affected my life as a, as, as a librarian. Uh, great, great inspiration. Yeah. <coughs> well, uh, tell us a little bit about the courses you taught uh, okay. in the um, college. You, uh, library science generally, but uh, is, uh, you mentioned more than one, so I presume that there was some specialization there. In those days, um, there weren't as uh, the, we had a very limited faculty, um, and so I taught a lot of the courses of reference and bibliography, and I taught cataloging and classification. It's one of the courses I enjoyed most was mm -hmm. administration of the school library, as we called it in those days, um, because it was kind of a capstone in terms of all of the courses, uh, because the director of a library is responsible for the whole operation, as I said before, budget and sure. and uh, and people and services and that kind of thing. Um, I never taught any of the courses, and we had uh, adjunct fact. Well, I say adjunct. We had the adjunct as well, though, as being in the College of Education provided an opportunity for um, our courses in children's literature, mm -hmm. but also for young adult or and adolescent. We had a fairly literature. good collection of children's books, and in the university library, we did. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Lichtai uh, taught, and Dr. Howell both taught courses in children's literature. And so those were courses that were required, fortunately, uh, for a library of science certification. So those were... Well, my knowledge uh, of it uh, stems from the fact that uh, my kids always used to go over there and take out books from <laughs> <laughs> children's <laughs> literature section. And you never, and once uh, you look at that collection, you think, why are these children's books in the universe <laughs> academic <laughs> library? But it's because we did have such a strong uh, uh, literature yeah, for children. It was a very nice collection yes. at the time. Yes, but I used those resources, uh, <laughs> both human as well as uh, those re uh, print resources. Did you get deal. involved in the information retrieval area at all? You mentioned computers, that's why. Uh, <clears throat> at the, um, one of the last courses I took at the University of Denver, I think, was called Information um, retrieval, and then we dealt with uh, uh, the very beginnings of, uh, mm -hmm. of computers and how we could um, store information and retrieve information, and um, that was really the beginning, I think, of uh, uh, of the changes in libraries. Because today, um, with technology sure. affecting. Uh, the uh, storage and, and retrieval billions access to of uh, billions of inquiries on uh, <laughs> on Google every day. Exactly, <laughs> and we have people I think that are I still think are kind of overwhelmed when we they search on Google. But you know there are a lot of information databases sure. you don't have access to unless you go to a university or if you are academic library and unless you have passwords right. and those kinds of things because those are subscription. Uh, um, and we oftentimes, I think, forget that not everything is on Google. <laughs> uh, I remember once reading a, a book in information retrieval back when it was a brand new word, mm -hmm. uh, and um, or re brand new phrase, I should say. Right. And uh, yeah. uh, the uh, thesis, central thesis of the book was that uh, well, there are. It's essentially a problem of two things, marking and parking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you remember that same book. But, uh, I think we've progressed a little since then. Yes, uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> more than just marking the Cutter Sanborn number on the book and uh, whatever. Right, right. You know, we have, uh, uh, you wonder about people who are going to go into library science, and, and they used to come in for their initial interview, in a sense. And they would say, oh, I enjoy reading. And that was great. Mm -hmm. But I always wondered, well, how do you like people? Because a librarian, in order to bring information uh, to people, needs to like reading, but you also need to like people. Yes. And today, of course, with so much technology, I think the, uh, you have to ask the question, are you comfortable? Are you willing to grow uh, yes. in, the, in this technological age that we have? 
<laughs> so it's not just a matter of love of reading anymore. <laughs> Did you uh, uh, ever get involved in any graduate programs while you were, uh, I mean, did they have library science <coughs> courses at the graduate level for students uh, who were we, uh, not, in the, not in the sense of a Master of Arts in Library Science. Right. We did develop uh, many of the courses then. We had uh, a graduate section of each course. I think there was maybe one or two that we didn't. But for persons who were interested in uh, pursuing uh, an advanced degree, which was a Master's in mm -hmm. Education, or it could be a master's in elementary education or secondary education, uh, then we did develop uh, many of the courses uh, at the graduate level. So you might have had elementary students as well as second undergraduates as well as graduate students in the same class, mm -hmm. right. Were you a member of the graduate faculty? I was a member of the graduate right. faculty, right. And that, uh, that was a uh, uh, an enjoyable experience. Yeah. It's always an enjoyable experience, I think, to get to know your uh, faculty beyond the college in right. which you uh, are serving, and I uh, think in terms of the faculty senate. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, let's uh, let's branch out a little bit from your uh, strictly curricular activities and talk a little bit about the various service activities you've had here, because you've had a lot of them uh, well, it's in the early that. days of the faculty center. Yeah, right, right. Uh, right. Um, it, uh, that I remember so distinctly when the faculty senate was formed mm -hmm. and and what is, you know, what is it with the role of the faculty senate and uh, and so we had lots of uh, great debates in those days and what's the role of the administration, what's uh, the yeah. role of the faculty and that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. But I really enjoyed the faculty senate because it brought you uh, face to face uh, or in committees uh, like you and I were. Uh, with faculty you might have not known otherwise yeah. outside of your department or outside your yeah. college and so the, uh, the the service on the faculty senate uh, here at the university was a great opportunity. The first uh, president of the senate was Dr. Paul Stageman. Oh yes. And uh, he yes. was a uh, chemistry, chemistry professor. Yes. And uh, he was one of the first people that we, uh, uh, Paul Borgi interviewed for this Reflections in Time series. So we've got a little bit of that history recorded. Sure, <laughs> sure. I remember one of the leaders of the Faculty Senate uh, and it was a Barbara Brillhart. Yes. And that was fairly on early on in, in the Faculty Senate, but she was the first woman right. uh, to become uh, president of the uh, of the Faculty Senate. And yeah, she was very, very active. And she was an extremely uh, um, good, uh, effective uh, president of the Faculty Senate. Yeah, I, uh, I worked a lot with Barbara and knew her very well. And sure. Uh, t tell you a little story about it. I think it's kind of funny. Uh, she, uh, uh, we used to try. This is back in the, in the probably late 60s, and where we were doing a lot of coordination work between the campus in Lincoln and sure. our campus in Omaha right. to try and uh, iron out how the university should be governed. Now they had an, added a new piece to it the, over yes. there in Omaha. Sure. And uh, so we used to travel weekly to Lincoln. <laughs> and uh, Barbara was one of the people that went with us. Sure. And I got on some committee. I don't remember which one it was, but I used to. Uh, I was a department chairman then, and used to uh, used to go there all the time. And mm -hmm. Barbara would go with me, probably yeah, yeah. as president of the Senate. Probably. Uh, and uh, the I remember the first time <coughs> she rode with us. Anyhow, we all would ride together in a car, and uh, we got out in the, the administration building in Lincoln, and. Uh, uh, the first thing to do after that long ride was to stop in a restroom. Sure. And uh, so we, uh, Barbara, we all got out. Barbara was the only woman in the group, and uh, we got out and we just automatically headed to the restroom. And she walked it right in there with us. And we had, I had to stop her and say, "No, Barbara, uh, yours is down the hall." Away. <laughs> uh, but um, we had a good time, and, uh, and oh, we yes. eventually got things set up and straightened right. out, and they seemed to work. Oh <laughs> yes, yes. Any time that there, you know, is a uh, we're working towards a common cause. I right. think that, you know, <laughs> uh, they're not always there's differences, but uh, the outcomes are usually good, and right. as they have been <laughs> since that time. Um, you uh, served. A, n a number of terms on the faculty senate. I did. Uh, it seemed like, as you know, it's an elected position, and you kind of like 
to serve because if others think you sure. can represent them, you like to do that as much as you can. And but after three year three three terms, those are three year terms. If I it is, yes. then you think I believe somebody else can um, uh, do this or needs the experience of doing it, and especially some of our younger faculty, sure. uh, it's good for them to do that. So well, it's important too because it's a it's an I see it as an obligation. That oh, I, somebody has to do it, and uh, and I would encourage people to faculty members. To uh, to have at least some experience in that area as as an obligation uh, yes. to the rest of the faculty. Really. I couldn't agree more. And right. I'd like to see everybody do it. Uh, oh yes, uh, yes. At sometime in their career. Right, take their turn in a sense. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you served on a number of uh, everybody in the university serves on committees, but you <laughs> served on uh, on a number of important ones, I think, didn't you? Well, both at the graduate level mm -hmm. as well as in our own department or the college, there were. A number of committees. Right. Uh, and that's another responsibility. It is, that goes with and that's the way the it's way uh, departments and colleges operate. Didn't we serve on a selection committee together? I think we Maybe did. Maybe more than one. Um, <laughs> probably did. You I, served on the committee that helped select uh, Dr. Weber, Dr. As, Weber. The, uh, as the as the chancellor, chancellor of the university. Yes. and I served on that one too. Okay. So that was one we served on together. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. that uh, you know, and that was. Uh, Oh, those are all time-consuming, but they're right. good experiences because you read about, and it's very interesting to read the resumes right. of the persons who sure. are applying for the degrees. Now, did you also serve on the committee that uh, selected a uh, successor to Dr. Christ as the uh, director of the library? It seems to me you did. But I did. Because I served on that one, too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, yes. we had uh, uh, Dr. Christ left... Um, Fairly suddenly, right. uh, under uh, not very pleasant circumstances. Correct. But um, uh, then he was succeeded by a temporary. But I think John Farr was a acting director of the library for yeah, a while. Really, that's true. Doctor Farr was, was assistant uh, vice chancellor for academic right, affairs. At right. Right. John did serve in that capacity. Right. And, and it took us a long time to uh, to select. A, I think uh, John served for at least. A year, right? Uh, well, and somewhere in that area, Ray Means served as acting, and then but there was an opportunity for Ray at Creighton, right? And when he went there, then John may have filled in a second time. I'm right. not sure, but Robert Runyon then, um, sure, I believe, was eventually yeah, hired. Uh, yeah, Bob Runyon became the uh, uh, director, and right? Right, uh, and served up until recently. Yes, yes, <coughs> hasn't been retired that many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and is still, and still active. You know. And you served on committees to review academic departments, uh, and, and that, that must have been interesting. The, too. Um, what you know, there were two. Maybe, of those. I, excuse me. Uh, let me interrupt for a moment. Our audience may not understand that. Uh, Every department in the university gets reviewed regularly. Uh, right. I think at least every five years, I some of them so. more frequently if mm -hmm. they need it. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and uh, committees are formed to, to do that. Right. And they uh, and they involve persons who are not in that department. And right. That's so you've got a chance to meet people from other departments. That and way. that was another opportunity and, and, and just a great experience here at the university is getting to know people from the other departments and colleges. Um, but they would do a self-evaluation and then there would be a person's um, uh, uh, identified to serve on that uh, committee in addition to an external person. Uh, who would have an expertise in that field. I remember serving, I think I served on the one in psychology, and I remember social work, mm -hmm. uh, decision sciences is one that I uh, served on. And those are, uh, 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 you know, you feel like that you just know the university yeah. a lot better, yeah. and that's good also in terms of being able to advise students. Well, and it keeps the departments honest because sure. you've got somebody there who has no... <laughs> No connection with them, and sure. uh, yeah, right, that's right, very good. So those are good and experiences. You, you had many, many other things that you did on the campus. I, uh, I, I know I read them, but I can't begin to enumerate <laughs> them. Uh, uh, well, I, I do want to mention though that on a couple of occasions, you were uh, nominated. Anyhow, oh. and the nomination is a great honor in it itself. Is. It's 
mm -hmm. kind of like uh, well uh, we're this time of year we're <laughs> approaching the Academy Awards and the nominees sure. are as right. important as uh, as the person selected. Right. So you were nominated on uh, on uh, at least a couple of occasions for the um, uh, Excellence in Teaching or Great True. Teacher Award, whatever right. it's called these days. Uh, but um, uh, but that was uh, that was quite a distinction. Uh, that was your uh, your, uh, your work as a teacher recognized that. Way. That's always a uh, <coughs> um, I guess you could say a, a thrilling uh, uh, experience simply because you are nominated by your students mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, so they're just on a number of occasions that I received that nomination, and uh, as I say, it's uh, especially rewarding because if it comes from uh, both from your students but also sure. your peers, yeah. uh, that was well. There a great are experience. so many other things here that you did both at the university and external to the university professionally, and uh, <coughs> you were. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission, I know that's a right, right. governmental appointment. Right. Dr. Uh, uh, Governor Thone, as mm -hmm. well as then uh, uh, doc, uh, Governor Carey, uh, I was appointed to Sir. Uh, two what does that terms. commission do? That uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is responsible for the provision of library services statewide. Okay. And so you uh, kind of coordinate the. You coordinate, uh, you uh, um, look at um, those persons who are not served, mm -hmm. and especially for persons who um, are in rural areas in the state, and we had many, uh, uh, unfortunately still have some, that are not served. In other words, they're not, they're not living within a taxable uh, jurisdiction to mm -hmm. provide services for the funding of a library. And so that was the responsibility of the, uh, and that was a good experience because you traveled throughout the state sure. to see what the services were. And then also to encourage our directors uh, to apply for federal grants as well as some, and development of state grants. Mm -hmm. um, so that was, a, uh, that was another broadening experience um, and went kind of hand in hand, I guess. Uh, uh, with my being uh, elected to president of the Nebraska Library Association, which again takes in the whole state. Sure. And, uh, and that's, uh, uh, we talked about service to the university a while uh, back, but uh, service to your profession is important too. And uh, as you well know, that's uh, expected. Uh, it, when we serve here at the university, our, our research, sure. our teaching, and our service, and it seemed like I was always um, finding myself uh, in service um, positions of the American Library Association or the Mountain Plains Library Association and those um, organizations which again though I think Jack you, those are rich because you bring back the experiences that you had uh, to your students and your other, other faculty members and so that makes you just a, a greater resource for the persons around you. Um, we have um, we've talked about uh, changes in the curriculum, a little bit about changes in the physical structure of the campus. Right. Um, but there have been other changes too. Uh, ha uh, what have you noticed over the years in terms of our student body? Oh, I was uh, thinking uh, earlier this morning uh, that. Uh, about the university and when I first became acquainted with it, and it was, they had a saying something like this is the night spot of the Omaha. The busiest night busiest spot, spot in town. In Milo town. Bale used yes, to say that yes. all the time. I remember. And uh, you know people who work during the day I would come for night classes including uh, uh, me mm -hmm. uh, that did that. But um, we've always uh, been, well for a long time we were kind of the, the home for the non-traditional student as uh, right. uh, and uh, uh, and I think we all you know during all that t tenure we had the bootstrap program right. and the bootstrap of course was the uh, program that Dr. Bale and General uh, Curtis LeMay, LeMay. At, the, at Offutt Air Force Base worked out to provide an opportunity for military personnel yes. to uh, earn a degree and get credit for their uh, uh, for their a a academic experience all exactly. over the world in many exactly. cases. And they were highly motivated, mm -hmm. uh, and so if you were a student, or if, uh, in, the, in which they were also your fellow students, they raised the curve. 
Did uh, you have many in your library science course? And we did have a few. When I began teaching library science, then I would have a number of people that would take them, not that they were planning to become librarians, but because they wanted to know more of how to find information. Mm -hmm. And I remember one particular man, uh, he was had graduated and he came back through the area and stopped to see me a couple of years later and he said, that was one of the finest courses I ever took because I learned how to find information on my own. And uh, so you feel good when you, uh, somebody, you know, comments and makes those kinds of judgments. <laughs> after Did you your experience course. with government documents play any I role? I think it may have, it may have helped. There's some. a lot of uh, military documents. That oh, there have. are, sure. And we did receive, you know, all those that were, let's say, not classified. And right. so it was good to be able to link those the bootstrappers with those resources that we had and which made the university again a good place good setting uh, for them but um, the diversity of students here has always been uh, just uh, really appealing uh, both as a when i was a student here but also as a faculty sure. member to have the non-traditional uh, uh, students as yeah i kind of miss those uh, we always had classes every night of the week uh, and, uh, <laughs> yes uh, you learn to uh, to teach uh, a three-hour block of courses and that was uh, that was difficult when I first started it was and we uh, of course my, uh, my students were uh, in uh, classrooms in the schools and so they would come to school at, and we would have classes from four to seven and then from seven to ten mm -hmm. and you know by the time you get out of class it's been a long day That's and right. uh, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of times I uh, you start home in the blizzard and uh, yes. I remember a couple of times I didn't make it home and one night stayed all night in at the ranch bowl but fortunately uh, you know you're inside and so you're not in danger but uh, you just kept on teaching and <laughs> that's right I but they were long sessions <laughs> yeah I remember the blizzard of 75 yes and, uh, yes people were uh, I stranded here on campus for a couple of days a lot of people were right. uh, were not able to um, to, well, they just weren't able. My car was parked on 72nd Street along with, it seemed like thousands of others. <laughs> well, uh, since you've retired, you've, uh, you've been very, very active in, uh, in service activities of different sorts, too. I, I think you're probably uh, well, the person I know that has the most volunteer activities <laughs> of anyone. Well, I uh, enjoy being retired uh, because it allows you to do things that you weren't doing before, although I still supervise sure. student teachers. And what's your association with the um, National Park Service? And the National Park Service, uh, uh, which uh, is in Omaha, the headquarters, and few people know that. The headquarters, is that a regional headquarters? It is, yeah. and we rep we have 13 states within uh, the Midwest. We, that changes from time mm -hmm. to time. But they, uh, years and years ago, they called me, well, to be exact, about 35 years ago, saying, you might probably have a student could help us out with our library. Their librarian had retired, and um, I uh, was unable to really find the right person for them, so they said, how about you? So I have worked for the National Park Service on a very part-time basis uh, for about 35 years. Now, what years. sort of library work do they have? And what they do is to serve uh, basically the staff that is here at the at their headquarters, and because at the headquarters, of course, they have engineers, they have botanists, they have historians, chemists, and archaeologists, and and so there is a rich collection at the National Park Service Library, which is now uh, on the riverfront. We oh, were in yes. an old building there, but the. Um, a Douglas County Correctional Facility at 16th and Jackson for a long, long time. So that was very exciting to be able to move uh, and develop a new library at the uh, on the riverfront uh, a few years ago. And I still continue to do that on a on a part time basis. So there's a there's a lot of uh, you can um, provide for you know service to your community. Mm -hmm. Just all kinds of opportunities, which. I really enjoy that. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit. We've talked somewhat uh, all, all through this uh, hour that we've been together about uh, people you've known, mm. uh, Ellen Lord, and uh, um, and some of the deans that you've known, Dean Gorman and Kennedy and others. Yes. Uh, but uh, there are so many people uh, that you've uh, must have worked with or uh, or known over the. Uh, 
many years you were here. Uh, have, is, are there any we'd missed? Any you'd like to talk more oh, about? I, like, I want to mention Ralph Wardle, uh, Dr. Oh, Wardle. Oh, instructors that you um, have. He um, uh, was, uh, uh, again, uh, probably one of the reasons why I just stayed uh, here at the university. He was such an uh, such a scholar and yet such a uh, a leader and a, a kind person. And Dr. Wardle, of course, was in the English and department. He, he head, mentioned English as one of your right. interests right, early right. on. So he was uh, the head of the department at that time. There was a Dr. Paul, I remember distinctly, that Al was Paul, in, yes, uh, in, in the, the uh, speech, speech department. department. And um, uh, Dr. Ed Clark, I was uh, oh, uh, interested in arts, drama yes. and he, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I was in uh, a production called Our Town, along with Peter Fonda, uh, and oh my uh, goodness. a fun experience, uh, and so I remember Dr. Clark. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, we're, I remember hearing on the radio, I think it was today, it's his birthday or something. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Joe Dunn, Dr. Dunn, in um, the College of Education, yes. as it goes way back, taught Ed Psych, he's the only professor that I ever knew that could have a Friday night class from, uh, I think it met from maybe, well, I think it met from 7 to 10, and it would be standing room only. I mean, it would oh, always fill. Uh, Joe Dunn had the best sense of humor of anyone that I've known on the faculty. He was, it's a pity he died so, uh, yes. so uh, yes. suddenly and early in his but he is retirement. He was only retired for a year or so when he yes. passed away. Right, but he uh, had a great uh, he influence. Uh, on me, yeah. uh, you know, Paul Ackerson uh, yes. was a college uh, colleague uh, and taught science education, and then was just a a teacher's teacher. Yes, uh, so interested in yeah, students. wonderful uh, reputation. Oh yes, yes, uh, taught science education and would just spend hours in the evening and Saturdays uh, going out and conducting workshops for teachers and so he is another one I think of. Uh, I always uh, used to get the names mixed up. There was Ackerson and Ackerman. <laughs> and, and Ackerman, uh, you know, died rather suddenly. Yeah. Uh, he was the uh, chairman of the uh, elementary education department and I believe maybe the first chair of the teacher education department and then did uh, die rather suddenly. and. Uh, but there was <laughs> Ackerson and Ackerman all both in the same department, yeah. and so <laughs> easily a, little, a bit confusing. Yes, it said. was uh, many many times yeah. you know, talking to students. Now, which one do you mean? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. And Dr. Ackerman spent a lot of time trying to organize a faculty club on campus. Yes, and, uh, yes. In fact, off campus, he did uh, work with uh, various. Uh, what should I say, bars or pubs around town <laughs> to uh, see if they wouldn't dedicate a room to us right, you know, so right. that we could uh, have a place to uh, congregate. Probably uh, uh, a lot of uh, action took place uh, off campus as well, uh, on campus as well as off action. Right off campus as a result of Bob's. Uh, right. <laughs> he was a real social leader. Yes, he was. Uh, and you never quite knew just where where are we meeting now? You know, <laughs> what pub? <or> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, those are some. Well, let's one more thing before we we're, we only have a very short time here, okay. maybe thirty seconds or so left. But uh, uh, you mentioned to me before we started here that you uh, you were familiar with the studio because you taught television oh. production courses here. Yes. Paul Borgie, I, I took a course from Paul here at the university, and then later on uh, we offered, I taught a summer course for several years, and these folks that are around us here this morning, um, uh, there were pre people in those roles that helped me teach a an educational television course in the summer. Wonderful. Same studio, and in we got to wind up now, uh, Vern. But uh, thank you for asking. So me. I do appreciate you. Uh, you're coming in today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And uh, to our uh, audience, thank you for joining us today in a visit with Dr. Vern Hazelwood, longtime faculty member of UNO. We've been taking a look at some of the history of UN Omaha, as seen through the eyes of those who have made this history. And this is Jack Newton inviting you to join us again in the series we call Reflections in Time.
Reflections in Time is made possible in part by support from the UNO Alumni Association, fostering a legacy of alumni giving since 1913.